So when we were planning the Lenten series several months ago, I trotted out to the worship planning team, something I've wanted to do for five or six years. I wanted to do a, a Lenten series on atonement and specifically atonement theories, which is simply ideas and ways of thinking about what God did for us through Jesus on the cross. There's a variety of ways of thinking about that, and I thought it'd be fun to explore those for six weeks. My worship team wasn't as thrilled about that. They, their eyes went back in their heads, and so we set to negotiating, and they won. And I'm going to talk about atonement theories for two of our six weeks. But the other four, we're going to use the theme of a garden. Um, and when you think about the trajectory of God's prevenient grace, chasing after us relentlessly, being present with us fearlessly, began in the Garden of Eden, continues all the way to the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus. And it ends with the garden tomb when Jesus meets as the risen Christ, the women who come to the tomb. So we'll be talking about gardens for most of this Lent and how it is that God's relentless love comes after us to be at one with us. Let's pray. Dear and gracious God, we thank you for your great love in Jesus Christ and the infinite ways in which you communicate that love to us through your Holy Spirit. May we in this season be open and be listening. Amen. It is that time of year. Uh, within the next oh, two weeks, uh, I will come home with a pickup truck full of compost and we'll set about spreading that out in my wife's 24 by 24 foot garden in, in the backyard, which right now is simply dormant and covered with the leaves that I gathered up from the fall uh, foliage and placed back there. The rest I mulched and put back into the lawn. And once I've got the compost, um, I'll drop that out there on the lawn and I'll pull out my little electric tiller and I'll work for a few hours to turn the leaves and the compost into the soil uh, to prep it. Uh, I'm a good tiller. And full disclaimer, I'm a tiller, but Cammy is the gardener. And with her magic touch, her green thumb, and a whole lot of attention and pruning, she turns it into something fabulous within just a few months. And it's a garden that's full of cilantro and beans and cucumbers and tomatoes and cantaloupes, enough crop to keep us going well all the way through the rest of summer. Now, I did not ask permission from my wife to show these pictures, <laughs> and I'm probably in trouble for that. Um, but I would have gotten in a whole lot of trouble if I were to show you the picture that I didn't put up in the slide pack. And because I value my marriage, you're not gonna see it. But one day, same when these pictures were taken, I secretly snuck out into the backyard knowing that she had just finished putting everything in the ground. And without her knowing, I'm over at the side with my cell phone she is lying flat on her back on the newly planted soil in her garden. And she is soaking up the sun and she is soaking up the satisfaction that this is good. This is very good. And I got the distinct feeling that this woman is at one with her garden and she's at one with her God who gives her this garden. Now, I have to imagine that when God got busy and then got finished in six days, separating light from darkness and land from water and order from chaos, and brought forth the wellspring in the middle of the garden that began to, the green shoots that became edible fruit and edible vegetables and trees, that at some point, at least in God's mind, 
God laid down on God's back in that Garden of Eden, soaking up the newly set sun in the heavens. And God smiled to God's self and said, this is good. This is, this is real good. It's with that sense of creative anticipation, it's with that sense of satisfaction that we begin our series on atonement or at one moment at the beginning. On the day the Lord God made earth and sky before any wild plants appeared on the earth and before any field crops grew, because the Lord God hadn't yet sent rain on the earth and there was still no human being to farm the fertile land, though a stream rose from the earth and watered all the fertile land, the Lord formed the human from the topsoil of the fertile land and blew life's breath into his nostrils. The human came to life. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east and put there the human he had formed. In the fertile land, the Lord God grew every beautiful tree with edible fruit. And also he grew the tree of life in the middle of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And as you remember from that earlier creation story, God looked at God's creation in the garden and said, this is good. This is really good. And what I love about this version of the creation story is the intimacy. That God creates this little clay figure out of God's topsoil, breathes God's ruach, God's breath into the nostrils of this little clay man and brings the first humans to life. And by doing so, enters into a partnership that says, I'm the creator, y'all are the trustees. You get to inherit, you get to use for a while that you're alive, this amazing garden, this amazing creation, this planet that I've given you, tend it well. And God is so proud of God's creature because God's creature has God's Imago Dei, right? Every one of you, we said this in our Wesleyan Roots series, each of you is of infinite worth and infinite value because God's mark is upon you in your soul. And it, be, it bespeaks an intimacy that God wants with every one of God's children. How many of you are parents or grandparents? One or two? So tell me if you remember this. Is there a more intimate experience with that newborn child than when you are sitting in the lazy boy or maybe lying on the couch or the bed and that little seven pounds of creation is lying on your chest and she is rising up and down with every breath of yours. And as you watch her breathe and you monitor your own breathing, and you see her going up and down with every one of your breaths, you can almost imagine that her breaths are in complete synchronicity with your breathing. If you can think that, if you can feel that, then I believe we have a sense of God's deep pride, of God's deep love with each one of us. And I'll ask you as parents and grandparents, does that desire to be at one with your child ever go away? No matter how big that child gets, do we not always want to be at one with them? Do we not always want to be in synchronicity with them? Do we not always want to be with them even when they really don't want to be with us? Because we're their parents, we're their creators, and with God, we desperately always want to leave that door open for the kind of intimacy we, we knew when she was going up and down on our chests when we breathed. Now we understand maybe just a little bit better that notion of prevenient grace that we talked about during the Wesleyan Roots series. That God is forever seeking after us. No matter who we are, what we've done, or how far we have run, God is chasing still faster to catch up with us and to be present with us with the hope and the strength that only our heavenly creator can give us. But as we know with our own children, 
So it happens in that first garden. The child begins to grow up, gets a little willful, gets a little independent, begins to think, oh, what does the old man know? I can figure this out for myself. I know better. Our ego, our pride, our selfishness. And in the story, of course, they reach for the fruit that God pretty clearly told them, just don't touch that. You can have everything else, but just don't touch that. And you know the rest of the story. Things don't go so well. And God has to come walking in the garden as every one of us as parents and grandparents have done, looking for our child, saying, where are you? Know that when you read that biblical story, that's not a question of geography. They're in the Garden of Eden. It's a question of the soul. Where are you? Where are you inside with your mind, heart, and soul? What is it that you've done? And how is it that we can reconcile and be at one with each other? Because I desperately want to be in sync with you. And I desperately want you to be in sync with me. This is the trajectory of the whole Bible. This is the trajectory of salvation, of God seeking after us when we've kind of pushed away and said, no, I, I think I can do this myself. Remember that we said a couple of weeks ago, God in the United Methodist understanding of the creator is not some old man sitting on a throne waiting to see how it all works out. No, Jesus was real clear. This God is our Abba. This God is our daddy, as that is properly translated. This God is one of deep intimacy who seeks to maintain that intimacy with every one of God's children. So in Lent, we're given the opportunity to reflect on that and reflect where it is we've been running. Reflect on what it is we're hiding Reflect on what it is that we've tried to hold to ourselves instead of sharing with others or letting others know that's killing us. Because if we're willing to be just a little bit vulnerable, we'll allow God to come walking into our gardens during this Lenten season and ask every one of us, where are you? What is it that you're doing? And how is it that we can get back in sync. We've been given a garden to tend. We've been given this world, this planet to manage. And as a good trustee, the best trustee, we manage it as well as the owner would if the owner was doing it by the owner's self. But by our track record, we've not done that really well. We've not managed the creation, the garden, or its peoples very well. We get full of our ego, we get full of our pride, we get full of our fear and our selfishness. And we scar the land with open pit mines and we leave the earth gouged. We wholesale take forests down and clear them for our own ambitions. We pour our pollutants into the air and into the water and we pour them onto people and put them in their neighborhoods. And then we wake up one morning and wonder, golly, what happened to the climate? What happened to the planet? No, when our pride gets in the way, it doesn't work out well. And we're given this amazing gift of Lent to really drill down within our own souls to hear God's question, where are you? And where do you need to be moving to get back in sync in this love affair between a parent and a child? Now, the good news is there's good news. And there's always the faithful within every church body who are diligent and determined to carry on this creative activity, to be partners with God that looks out not just for themselves and their own interests, but looks out for the needs of the world and does so whether they know who they are or not. And I believe this Lenten season is just such a season for First United Methodist Church of Plano. Here's about a dozen suspects that were uh, caught the other day. Um, they, were, they were caught in the act of tearing down a 
carport that with one more gust of wind would have blown over uh, in the, at the house of a member uh, who wasn't able to do this themselves. And so these guys pitched in and demolitioned that old carport and in the next few weeks we'll be building a new one. There were dozens behind who wanted to be there, but you only needed about a dozen to do this. And then there, then there were these suspects who were caught on the property next door at the Community Universalist Unitarian Church. Uh, they were over there on their property building a garden bed above ground and stocking it with a number of seedlings and small plants along with a couple of dozen other above ground beds that other individuals of their church and in the community are managing so that by summer's end, hundreds of pounds of fresh fruit and vegetables will be given to the local area food pantries that we support. Before this day is over, some of you will, and some of you have already gone to the blood bank out in the parking lot and are giving the unbelievable and unique gift of your life so that someone else may live and live healthfully. Thank you for that. And today, following this worship service, starting at 1215, we're gonna spend probably about an hour talking about being good stewards. Good stewards of this incredible garden that God gave us underneath a rainbow 24 years ago. And how we have faithfully managed that for good in the community for the last 24 years. But a new season is upon us. And we have opportunity now to respond to the question from God, where are you and what are you doing? To make a new decision to till the soil, if you will, to replant, to reset, and re-envision what God has for this church to do for the next 175 years. We're talking about taking what will still be a bountiful amount of property left, 12, 13 acres, and envisioning out in our new front door a green mall and new parking and new trees and maybe wildflowers, natural blue bonnets and Indian paintbrushes lining the two streets that meet at the corner. That's the kind of creativity and imagining that's, that's going on. What does our witness to the world from our garden look like in a second 175 years of our life? We're given the opportunity today to imagine what God would have us now do going forward. And I would like to think, I'd like to imagine that in the course of the coming months and years, if this goes through the way we're kind of hoping it will go through, that we'll each take an opportunity along the way, somewhere along the way, to be out there on the green mall, make sure they put down the stuff for ants, but to lay down on your back in the green mall of this newly created front door, stare up at the sky, soak in the sun and the satisfaction of what we have done together and allow yourself to say to yourself, this is good, this is real good. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.